Hello Booktube, and welcome back to your Daily Penguin. This is our slow crawl through my Penguin Classic wall, book by book, and author by author. <laughs> and for a while there I fell into a sinkhole of Romans. <laughs> I was doing one Roman author after another. And to correct that, I have been concentrating this week on Greeks, including the author that we're talking about today, although you wouldn't know it from his name. <laughs> his name was Flavius Arianus, uh, but he was a Greek, and he took the name uh, sort of the sobriquet Xenophon to add to his own name. Uh, and he was uh, from money. He was secure and well-to-do despite the fact that he was not a Roman. He was born in a Roman province to a family with Roman citizenship uh, and quickly displayed not only uh, go-getter's moxie <laughs> but also uh, real ability. Uh, and as a result he rose quickly in in uh, the, in the province where he was born, for instance, in Bithynia, and he eventually went to become a student of Epictetus and wrote down a lot of that revered wisdom <laughs> uh, for us, <laughs> and, and also seems, seems to have been profoundly impressed early on in his life uh, with the necessity to live a moral life, to, the necessity to be morally accountable to yourself. Uh, but it didn't. It didn't affect. He was a. He was a clear-eyed, sharp-nosed guy, a very intelligent, morally upstanding, probably slow to anger. Uh, exactly the kind of person that you would want if you were, for instance, an enlightened prince and you were trying to fill out your bureaucracy. Uh, and he was also, uh, as you might guess from that bit about Epictetus, he was a pedant. He was. He was a. Uh, a full participant in a fad that was going around the Roman world at the time, a sort of revival of uh, worshipping all things Greek, of affecting Greek uh, attire in public or at home, of affecting Greek hairstyles, like for instance barbaric facial hair, <laughs> and things like that, and also dropping uh, Greek bon mots <laughs> in conversation. The foremost exemplar of that fad, of that kind of behavior, was the Roman Emperor Hadrian himself, who a number of people, uh, rather anonymous wags in the, in the Roman Senate, referred to as the Little Greekling, for a number of different reasons, but, but it, one of the main ones was his cultural pretensions. And you get the strong impression that uh, Flavius Arianus, who we know as Arian, uh, fully partook of that. But it doesn't matter, because he was... Uh, he was evidently smart and level-headed, and he wrote for his whole life, and late in life, after he had achieved the pinnacle of Roman success, he, he went to Rome after Epictetus, after, after he'd known one of the foremost philosophers of his day, he went to Rome and climbed the cursus honorum, he climbed the, the civic ladder of public responsibilities, eventually ending up not only as a consul, which even under an emperor was a huge deal, a gigantic distinction, didn't hold the life and death, you know, awe-inspiring power that it had before the Empress, but it was still a mighty big thing. Uh, but it was not only that, but he also uh, commanded legions in combat and was given the governorship of one of the biggest and most uh, potentially lucrative provinces in the Roman Empire. It was also, you had to earn your money. <laughs> in the province, of the one particular province that we're talking about, you had to earn your money because there were uprisings all the time. Uh, and he acquitted himself well. There's no, there's no hint of uh, scandal. There's no hint of uh, bribery or extortion or uh, incompetence on the battlefield or anything like that. And, uh, you know, political times change, <laughs> as, he, as, as Arian knew perfectly well since he was old enough to remember Domitian. Uh, and sooner or later he left Roman service and, and retired to Athens which at the time was uh, sort of like Brooklyn in being the gravitational center, the gravitational black hole that pulls in all people pretentious, any kind of pretentious, and you start to feel the pull in that direction. And he retired to Athens to write, full-time, as we put it today. Uh, but the, the poobahs and powers that be in Athens could no more ignore the qualities that had brought him to Hadrian's attention than Hadrian could. And sooner... Sooner rather than later, in Athens, in his alleged retirement, he became an archon of the city, which is an, an, a, the equivalent of a consul. It's a major distinction. And I can't, I admit, right now, I haven't researched, off the top of my head, I can't think of another prominent figure in the Roman world, a figure of this kind of prominence, who was both a Roman consul 
and an Athenian archon in his lifetime. I, but one way or another, that is an amazing CV. <laughs> and he, Arian becomes thereby one of the many figures that we are going to see, and a few we've seen already on this March of the Penguins, uh, whose personal life is fascinating and would make for, if only we had any kind of first-hand information, it would make for great reading on its own. Uh, but in, in retirement, although he'd been working on it for decades, uh, Arian took upon himself, among many other literary works, many of which we do not have, the idea of writing a military history of Alexander the Great. And it's mighty lucky for us that he did, because he wasn't as bad at it as a lot of other people who went at the same task. Of course, that task was old. That task was as old as Alexander himself. While Alexander was still alive, most of his major lieutenants, most, most major hangers-on, uh, cooks, animal keepers, family members and friends back home <laughs> in, uh, in uh, Pella, were eager to write books. And when Alexander was gone, most of them did. There were quite a few absolutely invaluable primary sources that we don't have. But Arian had them. And, and he had them in the same extent, or maybe even more, uh, than Quintus Curtius Rufus, who we've seen, and a few other of the, uh, of the historians that we know. Arian had those sources in front of him. And it's good for us that he, we, we, we would of course rather have those sources. No doubt about that. But it's good for us that someone like him did have those sources because he is able to, he's writing from them, and critics have said, well, he's basically just rewriting King Ptolemy's memoirs. Uh, that's not true. You can easily determine in the course of this book where he's switching sources. I think it's easy to determine. The point isn't so much uh, the the practice, which we've seen already in, in the March of the Penguin, of writers basically giving you so-and-so on such-and-such a part of my story, and then when, I, when he's no longer interesting or he doesn't have the best anecdotes, then I'll move to so-and-so on another part of my story. Uh, in the ancient Greek world, in the ancient Roman world, even to this point, the idea that you would take all of those original sources and then write basically completely original prose on your own would have been a little strange. It's normal now. You publish or perish now on that regard. And anyone in, in academic history writing today who used a methodology like Arian would be bounced out of their program immediately and would never get work anywhere else. It's so weird. Uh, it's weird how that happens. But one, one way or another, uh, the point I want to make is that you're, we're dealing here with a very different historical mindset than, for instance, Tacitus who is blindingly original, even when he is heavily relying on sources. Uh, Arian isn't quite like that, but it doesn't really matter, because we, you'd be looking at, you'd be a horrible ingrate to, to natter about such things when, without this, God knows what we'd be, we know what we'd be left with. We'd be left with romanticizers, and people who, uh, even if they're trying to maintain a kind of strict criteria on the, the sources that they have in front of them, don't have the experience. Arian had run. He had been essentially the voice of Rome in a vast province, an unruly province. He had commanded troops in the field. That, that, that is, that is uh, comparatively rare among Alexander historians. Uh, and he, he had known many worlds, not just the insular Roman world and not just the insular Greek world, but uh, many different cultures. He's, in other words, a perfect person. If we can't have those original sources in front of us, we want somebody like Arian to have them in front of him and write a book like this. And he does. Uh, he does a really good job. The, the histories, the campaigns of Alexander are really entertaining reading and very human. Uh, they, they have their flaws. Arian is uh, never quite lost that original taint of being a moralist. <laughs> so he never quite loses that in the course of his book. This is the Penguin Classic translation by Aubrey de Selincourt. Uh, and it is wonderful, although it, this, the way that de Selincourt translated these things lays it open to one Achilles heel more than any other, which is that the idiom of de Selincourt's day will creep into his work. I think that's one of the main reasons, that and the fact that he wasn't, he wasn't always scrupulous about word choice, 
is what leads him to be so often quote unquote revised in, in later editions. And you'll see that. I have, a, I have an example here uh, that I want to read to you uh, because a couple of you pointed out to me something, a very good pointer. We're only in early days for the March of the Penguins. We have, we have months and months and months to go, so pointers are great. And one of, one of the things that people have been pointing out to me, uh, including a couple of you who are unfairly situated to know, <laughs> uh, is that I have written enormously on almost all of the things that I'm talking about, and would it, would it be too much trouble for me to link some of that, for those of you who are recherche enough to want to read prose? <laughs> and I haven't done that. I haven't done that at all. Uh, and another thing that people have pointed out is, you know, could you read us from a little bit of the work in question, from the translation? in question. Uh, just to give us a, a tiny little taste. That's a very good idea, and I'm, 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 I'm bothered that it didn't occur to me, so I'm going I'm to read you just a bit. It'll give you an idea of what you can expect in the Aubrey de Selincourt translation of Arian, and also a little bit of what you can expect from Arian himself. And the situation here is uh, Alexander, Alexander and his crack troops invaded everywhere. <laughs> they they, they uh, invested everywhere, sieged everywhere. They were almost unstoppable, and at one point they took over a hilltop kingdom named Sogdiana, uh, and the, there was a king, uh, of course a little, a little hilltop king, and he had a beautiful daughter <laughs> named Roxanne. And when Alexander meets her, the, the legend that sprang up almost immediately is that he fell head over heels in love with her. And this is, this is Arian on that moment. <clears throat> one of the daughters was named Roxanne. She was a girl of marriageable age, and men who took part in the campaign used to say she was the loveliest woman they had seen in Asia, with the one exception of King Darius's wife. Alexander fell in love with her at sight, but captive though she was, he refused for all his passion to force her to his will, and condescended to marry her. For this act I have, on the whole, more praise than blame. As for Darius's wife, said to be the most beautiful woman in Asia, either he felt for her no desire, or if he did, he controlled it, in spite of the fact that he was both young and on top of the world. See what I mean? <laughs> uh, on top of the world. Uh, a combination of circumstances which leads most men to all sorts of excess. But he respected her and let her alone. In this he showed great restraint, and also, no doubt, a quite natural anxiety to be well spoken of. You can see there, that happens often, that, that Arian revi uh, reverting to a moral judgment, to looking at things in a moral level. Was Alexander courteous? Was he magnanimous? Was he restrained? That happens all the time in the campaigns of Alexander. You wouldn't think it, because it's a primarily a military history, and Arian wrote other military works as well that I would get killed to have, uh, including a long work on the Emperor Trajan, which would be irreplaceable. But, uh, but you see a number of things there uh, that aren't quite in Arian in the original. So you have to map onto this the fact that Aubrey de Salincourt, his method of translating often was to take huge chunks, big blocks of little scenes. A scene like that would be the perfect thing he would do. Take that in the Greek, read it in the Greek, not really bother about other people's translations, read it in the Greek and then mull it over and then write it instead of the Greek here, your open page here, you are translating. Instead of doing that, he would often do a sort of mutatus mutandus thing where he would, he would read it, mull it, get the sense of it, and then write it. Uh, and so, and the, you're vulnerable there for, for idioms like the top of the world. You're also vulnerable for the fact that the, a translator who does that is almost invariably going to reproduce his own speech patterns as opposed to the patterns of of the trans of the original author, and you get that in this segment in the fact that uh, the narrator here is professorially interrupting himself so often. Right? We have uh, uh, where was it? But comma captive though she was, comma he refused, comma for all his passion, comma to force her to his will, comma and condescended to marry her. For this act, I have, comma on the whole, comma more praise than blame, and so on and so forth. That professorial note is much stronger in Albert de Salincourt than it is in Arian. But nevertheless, the thrust of that paragraph, the, the thrust of that passage, uh, is a moral portrait. It's a, it's a, and, and believe me, Arian is just as censorious when he thinks that Alexander is morally bankrupt or are at fault, which is often. <laughs> Alexander very quickly, even in his own lifetime, but very quickly afterwards, became a moralizer's hobby horse because of all the stories of uh, <clears throat> uh, decadence and dissolution once he got to Asia, having 
having harems, having concubines, having all-night drinking fests when he had better things to do. Uh, the, the, most of that is anachronistic, but the, of course, uh, Arian faints very hint, very lightly in that in that passage. That maybe one of the reasons that Alexander left the wife of King Darius the Great alone is because he wasn't interested in her. And that is a thread that was picked up and run with by, for instance, the novelist Mary Reynaud, who, whose point was that he was hardly interested in any women, including Roxanne, and that all of this was statecraft. Uh, if, if so, the, the passage that, that I read you goes on immediately to the fact that when King Darius learned that, that his, that his wife and also his mother were being treated with honor and, given, and being allowed to retain their sober case, being allowed to be called your royal highness, even though they were captives of war and could easily have been in, in if they had been captured by, for instance, many a Roman legion, <laughs> they would not have had, let's just put it delicately, any of those things. <laughs> um, and in, later on in this same passage, King Darius learns that and is overjoyed. Sings Hosanna of praise to Alexander. So you can see that the story is breeding ground for drawing morals on what good rulers should do and what they should be like. Unfortunately, Alexander has drawn that kind of thing like flies to meat, and I imagine always will. Uh, but this is further away from relying on that as the reason for writing a book than any other Alexander source that we have that we don't have. To call this a source is just brutal, but in the limited lexicon of what we have, it's the best one. So... And the Aubrey de Salincourt translation flows like a stream. It is, as it, like all of his other translations, it is as smooth and easily readable as anything you're ever going to pick up in a book. Uh, I wish that I could show you a thousand-page book called The Collected Aryan. I really wish I could. We have a number of things that, as far as I know, have never been translated into a popular edition in English. The Campaigns of Alexander will never fall for translation. It will never lack for them. They'll always be there. But this, I think, will always be my favorite in English. Uh, and that, that is your Daily Penguin. That is your Penguin for today. We finally got to Arian. <laughs> now, so, so we can invite uh, Matthew at Mayberry Book Club back into the room. <laughs> Since I, I played an horrible prank on him a few weeks ago. Uh, so that is it. That is your Daily Penguin. We will move on. Not exactly sure when. Uh, possibility of disruptions in our normal patterns. <laughs> All will become clear. Uh, but w when we do, I am, I am now considering the scales to be balanced. So we will now go teetering back and forth between Rome and Greece instead of just Greece. Uh, but I, we, one way or another, when we resume, we will resume. <laughs> Thank you, Book Two.